All right, so we're back and we're going to talk about social justice and Christianity, where they intersect. Exciting. So I was watching a video featuring the pastor John MacArthur. He's a Calvinistic Protestant who preaches at a big church called Grace Community Church in California. Are you familiar with him? Yeah, I've heard the name. Um, I haven't actually read much or seen much by him, but to the video. Well, he's quite a polarizing character, I would say. But in this video, he asked someone, or someone asked him a question about the Bible and social justice. And he says, Justice is not a word that needs an adjective. And if somebody puts an adjective on justice, then they have something else in mind. Hmm. So he's, he's not a fan of the idea of social justice. Not at all. In fact, he's strongly opposed to the social justice movement as a whole. But to me, his remarks are a good il illustration of how historically Reformed and Lutheran traditions have been more interested in preserving the status quo, at most seeking to alleviate poverty maybe, but not taking the radical demands of the gospel seriously. You know, which is so odd to me. Um, and sometimes uh, hearing these guys, it's hard to believe we're reading the same Bible. Um, and it's not just the gospels. Uh, there are like 2,000 verses in the Old Testament that have to do with economics, which is a lot more verses than there are for more, um, you might say, Christian-y words like faith and, and love. Right, the feel-good stuff. Mm. But it's pretty clear in the Old Testament that God hates the disparity between rich and poor. And you can read lots of admonitions to lend freely, to be open-handed, divide equally, and not to take advantage of others, and so on. And then you have this concept of the year of Jubilee, which comes every 49 years, where property is supposed to be returned and it points to a notion of ownership that is communal and not individual. And in that context, you understand the commandment to not steal quite a bit differently as speaking against somebody or a person who would appropriate communal possessions for their private use. Right. And in our very individualistic age, uh, this notion of, of the commons, of, of, of um, common ownership, is really kind of strange and hard to connect to. Then you get to the Synoptic Gospels, where far and away the most common ethical subject is the danger and the proper use of wealth. Putting aside the theme of the Kingdom of God, the question of wealth is the most addressed issue within the Gospels. Basically, although Jesus doesn't say possessions are evil per se, he makes it pretty clear that wealth isn't safe because it competes um, for allegiance in our lives. Right, and if you look at the stories in the Gospel that involve people of means or wealth, like Zacchaeus the tax collector, you're always seeing them giving away their wealth to people in need which to me is what it means to store up treasures in heaven and not here on earth. So moving on, early Christian writers spoke constantly about voluntarily giving up wealth. For example, Basil the Great, Bishop of Caesarea Mazaka in the 4th century, says, Fling wide your doors. Give your wealth free passage everywhere. And then John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople, imagines what would happen if everyone in his city put all their money into a common fund. We're talking about Constantinople. There would be no poor and everyone would have, would have enough. And yet, he says, people are more afraid of this way of life than of a leap into an endless sea. Well, and things have not changed uh, much since then. So we talked briefly in our first video about Catholic social teaching, uh, which is by far the most robust theology of social justice. And we should talk a bit more about that. Uh, broadly speaking, Catholic social teaching speaks against income inequality and usury, um, interest, taking interest, which puts the majority of wealth in the hands of a few. And this uh, teaching starts really with Pope Leo XIII's 1891 encyclical Rerum Novarum, where although he defends the right to private property, he says that material possessions should be considered as common to all and shared without hesitation with those in need. Which would make it not private, but whatever. <laughs> then more recently you have Pope John Paul II in Solicitudo Re Socialis referring to the doctrine of the universal destination of goods and restating the principle that the goods of this world are originally meant for all. Preferential option for the poor, a newer principle of Catholic social teaching, 
which was championed by liberation theologians like Gustavo Gutierrez in South America in the latter half of the 20th century, while it was denounced at the time for being Marxist, actually comes directly from the gospel. Then the current pope, Pope Francis, has, as his namesake would suggest, been a real advocate for the poor. And in Laudato Si, uh, that's his encyclical that's primarily about the environment and climate change, which he says um, climate change uh, is pretty plainly caused by greed. In there he also emphasizes that Christian tradition, and here's a quote, has never recognized the right to private property as absolute or inviolable, and has stressed the social purpose of all forms of private property. And it's funny for the Bruderhof, coming from the Anabaptist tradition that's but so sharply from the Catholic Church, to be looking at these teachings. But one aspect of our tradition that has more in common with Catholicism than Protestant or evangelical traditions is the idea that a Christian should seek to imitate Christ in his or her life. Christ who was poor, who served, who sacrificed himself, and so forth. For Anabaptists, Love is a chief marker of the believer, and this love is made visible through self-denial. As Jesus said, whoever does not deny himself is not worthy of me. And surrender of private property. He also said, go sell everything you own, then come and follow me. This, by the way, does not mean that we choose asceticism as monastics like Francis of Assisi did. Created things are good and beautiful and to be enjoyed. Interestingly, in G.K. Chesterton's biography of St. Francis, it seems like it wasn't asceticism for asceticism's sake. He says, Francis saw himself as a lover, referring to the French troubadours, and he rejected creature comforts because he was completely consumed by the object of his love. Uh, as you do. Uh, but actually, I don't believe you have to completely reject the good things in life. They are, as you said, uh, created to be enjoyed. What's wrong or dangerous is, is clinging to wealth, and it's also potentially idolatrous. So for the early Anabaptists in particular, they discovered that Jesus' admonitions not to worry or be anxious about material things only actually make sense in the context of becoming part of a people who share everything, where it's not individuals facing the world as Lone Ranger Christians. And that's a thought that's echoed by 19th century theologian Christoph Friedrich Blumhardt. He says, and I love this quote, when the Apostle Paul says, do not worry, he takes it for granted that these are people who are so united by a bond of solidarity so that no one says anymore, this is mine, but all say, our solidarity, our bond, must take away our worries. All that we share together must help each one of us and so rid us of anxiety. So for us, the Catholic principle of common destination of earthly goods is well and good, but we believe you need to take it farther, which is why we practice community of goods. Part of the idea behind community of goods is that God did not mean for things to be held privately and by appropriating things for yourself, you become a thief because everything was created free and in common. The more you hold on to created things, the farther you are from the likeness of God. It's almost like a security blanket. Hmm. Um, that's actually not helpful and not the true security that you find in God. In this way, by living with things in common, we try to live in a society that is just within itself. And because we share this commitment to simple, sustainable living, we also end up with resources we can share to promote economic justice in the world around us as well. Uh, so that's us. I think we should also give a nod to social justice strains in modern revival movements, um, which also had a big influence on our founding. Um, for example, Charles Finney's work to abolish slavery and uh, William Wilberforce, whose conversion also led him to work against the slave trade um, for prison reform and for improving uh, working conditions, among other things. Right, there's a lot of inspiring people, not necessarily Christians or people that call themselves Christians, but I'm thinking the same time period you have Susan B. Anthony from a family of activist Quakers who was inspired by the Quaker belief that everyone's equal under God and became extremely well known as a social reformer advocating for abolition of slavery and women's suffrage. What a hero. <laughs> a real hero. Uh, glad we could tack those on. That's it for this video. There'll be more coming and uh, if you like them please 
uh, do like the videos and subscribe to our channel. We appreciate it. Thank you.